We now know that the UKIP leader, Paul Nussel, is going to stand for election and he'll be doing it in the seat of Boston and Skegness, which is the most Eurosceptic uh, place in the country. And he joins me now in the studio. Thanks for being here. So you've announced that you're standing in Boston and Skegness. That's quite a commute from your home in Stoke, isn't it? How many times (laughs) have you been to Boston? (laughs) A fair few times. I was there in Skegness uh, yesterday. I've been there a fair few times. I've given speeches uh, within the constituency, spoken to the local councillors. In fact, the last thing I did when I was UKIP chairman was take the UKIP conference uh, to Skegness. Uh, But as I say, this is the most Eurosceptic seat uh, within the country. We've got councillors right across the constituency. The branch were very keen for me to stand in this constituency and I was only too happy to take up their offer. Well, if you've been there so many times, you should be thrilled at at what we're going to do next, which is a little game, just to test how well you know the seat that you're going to stand in, Boston or Loston. All you've got to do is look at the picture on the screen and say whether or not this is a picture of Boston or somewhere else in the country. Here's the first one. What do you reckon? Boston or not? I don't... um, Boston, I'd say. Am I correct? That's Aylesbury Town Centre. Is that Aylesbury? Okay. I can see the market. Uh, You might be distracted by that, but... But come on. Okay, let's have a look at the next one. What, What about this one? Boston or not, what do you think? Yes, I'd say Boston. Well, you're correct. That one is Boston. Well done. Uh, number three... How about this? Are you looking at Boston or another place in the country? Um, I would say Boston. I'm sorry, that's not again? Boston. Okay. I'm sorry, that's not Boston. That but, 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 hang on, so, Sophie. I mean, uh, how about this one? Uh, that's Boston. That is Boston. Yes. Correct. Thank and then just one more, last one, and then we'll put you out of your misery, I promise. This is... Final one. Uh, that's not Boston, no. That is not Boston, correct. That is Stoke Minster. Yes. Thanks for being a good sport and playing along. A little bit Thank of you. homework to brush up on, but you, perhaps. But, you know, I want to make a point here. People often say, oh, well, you have to be from the local constituency and all the rest. This isn't a council election. This is a parliamentary election. But people and the, care but, about but, local issues up, as the, well, don't yeah, but, they? Yeah, but, the, but the vast majority of MPs, I would suggest to you, do not actually come from the constituency in which they represent. This is about putting this area on the map. I'm a national political figure. I'm a national party leader. When I stand up in the House of Commons to represent the seat of Boston Skegness, people will listen. Now, I'm also keen to talk about your integration agenda that you launched uh, this week, something that's had a lot of uh, scrutiny um, for numerous reasons. But one point that I was quite, quite keen to raise is why is it that you think that if a white man rapes a white girl, he should get a lesser sentence than if an Asian man or a black man rapes a white girl? Why, why is that? Uh, Well, we've obviously had the issue uh, surrounding the rape gangs in um, certain areas across uh, the country. I would suggest that they should be classed as a hate crime uh, because I think they are targeted on specific uh, people, uh, specific, uh, I think obviously uh, white girls are targeted by these gangs. But what I will say, and make it perfectly clear, is that, you know, rape uh, should take, uh, there should be a a long sentence, Uh, people should be punished for it. Uh, But as I say, I do think that these should be classed as hate crimes. Because if we look at the law, and we can be specific here, it's section 145 of the Criminal Justice Act. Mm. It currently states that if an offender demonstrates hostility towards a victim based on their race or religious group, it's taken as an aggravating factor in sentencing. So as far as I can see, the only change you want to see is that actually you're removing the idea of intent and it should just be based on the the no, but, but, skin colour. No, uh, well, hang on. No, I mean, obviously these girls are being targeted, I, I suspect, because Again, that's already covered rel- by the law, isn't it? Yeah, but I, I would suggest that they should also be classed as a hate crime as well. I think they are being specifically targeted. If you just look at the amount of rapes that we're seeing across the country, uh, specific, by a specific uh, a section of a community, and they're perpetrated generally against the same kind of girls, I think we've got a real problem that needs to be tackled. Um, the other thing that you were keen to talk about and address is uh, female genital mutilation. Yes. Abhorrent, clearly, a, yes. an abhorrent, appalling practice that more does need to be done about. Um, but you do want to see mandatory checks on schoolgirls from at-risk groups. Yep. And I'm just really a bit puzzled by this. What, what exactly do you mean by that? How are you going to choose well, which five-year-old girl has to 
effectively drop their knickers in front of well, well, hang on, hang on. I, 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 please don't put it like that. I mean, but that's what this happens in we France. Have to, but we have to, but we have to this, talk about... This, I don't, this, I, I'm not, I'm not trivialising it. I just think it's very important to talk about exactly what we're so we, talking th about here. This happens in France, OK? It already happens on the continent, and they have a far more successful prosecution rate of female genital mutilation. I'm just going to pick you up on that point well, in France, on, because but, but, what they do in France is that everybody has to do it. You're not just picking out a specific group. But, and there are also questions they, about how successful it is, because what you see is people just having it done later in their life. But, but, but there are specific groups who are at risk. So, for example, if a young girl is taken to Somalia, particularly during the cutting season and returned to this country, uh, you, you know, that is obviously someone I would suspect is at risk. Now, the, you know, look, for example, uh, if social services think that a young person has been abused, they have the right to enforce medical checks, I would suggest to you that female genital mutilation not only is abuse, it's actually grievous bodily harm. And look, last year alone, there were 8,500 new cases of FGM, and it's a disgrace that this has been illegal for nearly 30 years in this country, and there hasn't been one single successful prosecution. I You're think, turning a blind eye. I think that no one would disagree that it is it's ridiculous that the prosecution rate is so low yeah. and that this is something that is effectively but, 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 but we're turning a blind eye so but I want to talk about how you're proposing to deal with it here are you effectively saying that any girl from a specific African country means that any time she goes to Disneyland with her parents will have to come and have a stranger inspect her genitals when she gets home? Uh, no, because they're, they're generally going to other countries uh, to have this done, uh, specifically countries where FGM is commonplace. And, so you're uh, and hang, only and hang to go on, to a hang specific on, country hang where on, FGM is... Hang on. And, issue. you know, there are, actually, there are cutting seasons in these countries as well, and it's something we're turning a blind eye to. What we've done is we've put forward an agenda to at least to try and tackle these issues where the other parties simply want to turn a blind eye. And you know the mandatory checks? You know, the first people who suggested this were actually Diane Abbott and Keith Vaz from the Labour Party, and there was no uproar when they did it. But you're saying here in your integration agenda mm -hmm that these girls should be put through these checks whenever they return from overseas. Now, that seems to be different from what you're saying now, which is if someone is going to a specific country during cutting season. Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, obviously, we set forward... We so put you're forward, rolling back? We, I, I, I'm not rolling back at all. I mean, we put forward the agenda. Of course, it will be nuanced when it comes to uh, the manifesto, but I do think it's quite clear that there are certain girls from certain communities who are at risk from this, and we have to do something about it. So, specifically, are you not, you're no longer saying, then, that all girls from these at-risk groups, whenever they return from anywhere overseas, will have to go through these inspections? I think it's quite clear that certain countries, uh, if they visit... Uh, whereby they will return from these countries and there will have to be checks uh, taking place. Because so that's different these, but That's different but, from but what these, but these, As I say, saying. These if they go to countries where FGM is clearly commonplace and they return, I think it's only fair and equitable that they're checked. OK, that seems to be a sl slightly different position from Not what we said. Different. Sli well, we'll agree to disagree on that. Um, now... Let's talk a bit more widely about UKIP. After the referendum, you were on uh, sort of the dizzy heights of around 16% in the polls. Now you're routinely on single figures. Yep. UKIP voters are turning to the Conservatives, who they believe are the ones who can deliver Brexit. I mean, it, it's a pretty depressing picture, isn't it? It looks a bit like game over. Well, do you know, I always expected that there'd be a fall of the polls for UKIP in the first week of the campaign. The Prime Minister has had a massive amount of publicity as a result of calling this general election. Uh, we've probably fallen by 3 or 4%. Um, I have to say, I think UKIP's future is quite bright. We've quite not got bright. an Yeah, I really do, actually. I really do. And I think we've got an election which is now on our turf. We're going to target ruthlessly in this general election. There won't be a scattergun approach. We'll drill down into local seats and I believe that we'll get people over the line and we'll have UKIP representatives in the House of Commons come the election. A target approach. Is that a rather positive spin on the fact that you're just not bothering to stand in very many seats? I mean, can you really oh, no, see yourself no, 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 no. as a serious political no. party if you're effectively not standing in large swathes of the country? Oh, no, we'll be standing in the vast majority. So how many seats are you standing in, then? Uh, the, there will be, it will be in the hundreds, OK? And it will be far closer to 600 than the 100 that the uh, certain newspaper put out last week. So in the vast majority of the country, you will have the opportunity and go out, to go out and vote UKIP. However, there will be 
be certain seats, and I'm talking tens, not hundreds, where UKIP will be prepared to stand aside uh, for real Brexiteers. Not five to midnight Brexiteers or fly by night Brexiteers, people who've campaigned for Brexit all their lives, regardless of political affiliation. So, why are you not standing ill for North End? Because the Conservative MP there back remain. Sorry, why am I standing? Why are, you, why are you not standing in Ilford North? Because the Conservative MP there back remain. Uh, well, I, I, again, I, th that is something which the National Executive Committee of the party will have to look at. But I'm talking about seats uh, like Berry North, where you've got David Nuttall, for example, who's sitting on a majority of 350. And this is a guy who's campaigned for Brexit all his political life. The last thing UKIP should be doing is standing and ensuring that he loses his seat and we have a Remain MP instead. You see, what this does underline, really, is that UKIP is a single-issue party. If you're not standing uh, in seats where there's a Brexiteer, then that is a pretty clear signal that your party is all about Brexit, and that means when Brexit happens, there's no use for you. I don't agree, Sophie. Uh, obviously, we have a full raft of domestic policies. So why are you uh, saying but, but that hang you're on, not standing hang on. in seats This is a where specific Brexit because this is a specific Brexit election. The Prime Minister has called this election because she said that she needs a mandate for Brexit. And what we want to do is to ensure that we get the kind of Brexit uh, that we want, and I believe what the British people voted for on June the 23rd, and that is a Brexit whereby we have real control of our borders, control of our own finances, and we bring democracy back to this country. And we will only stand aside in seats where these MPs have stood alongside us for many, many years. People like Philip Hollibull. Um, now, you, of course, failed to win in Stoke. Yep high profile, you put your neck on the line there, you didn't win. Now you're going for Boston and Skegness, as you say, the most Eurosceptic seat in the country. Mm -hmm. If this election is all about Brexit, as you say, and UKIP are the only ones who can hold the Prime Minister's feet to the fire, if you fail, it's going to be game over, isn't it? No, because regardless of what happens in this election, UKIP has got a great future. Uh, I generally believe uh, that the Prime Minister won't get the deal that the British people want. I think she'll begin to backslide. And that's why it's dangerous if we end up with a huge Tory majority, uh, because you'll end up with hordes of Tory lobby fodder which, who will vote anyway, which she says, and it will be easier for her to backslide, because at the moment she's beholden to around 50 real Brexiteers. Uh, but UKIP's future will be bright. She will backslide. She will backslide on our fisheries. I believe in the end she'll backslide on freedom of movement. And indeed, once she gets that whopping majority, I think she'll go over to Brussels and sign the bill for 50 billion for the divorce bill. That isn't what British people voted for. You put your neck on the line though, aren't they, you, by running again and risking failure again. What, what are you going to do if you wake up the next morning and you've lost and you've not got any MPs? Uh, we will just continue. We will continue because we will know eventually will politics, you as politics will come back. Hang on. I, 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 listen, I don't think I will be in that situation. I think we will get MPs elected uh, to the House of Commons at this general election. Uh, but UKIP's future anyway is going to be bright. And I, I, I promise you, we will go up massively in the polls in the years to come uh, and our membership will rise significantly. The future's bright for you, Kip. You see, you've said before that if, even if you lose uh, this uh, election that you're running, this constituency that you're running in, you'll still stay on as leader. I'm not entirely sure if I believe you. I'm going to level with you here. I'm not totally sure that I believe you'll stay on me. as leader. <laughs> I, I, you strike me as a bit of a reluctant leader anyway. It's not going to be much fun, is it, staying on you know, if UKIP do collapse in this election. Do you know what, quick, won't you? Well, no, do you know what UKIP's got to do, Sophie? And this is what we were going to do over the summer, but it's all been put on hold as a result of this general election. It needs to restructure itself into a branch level uh, and a county level. It needs to have a new constitution and clearly define powers for the national executive and the leader and whatnot. It also needs to rebrand and get ready for a post-Brexit world. And these are all of the plans that we were going to unveil, or we will unveil actually, at Torquay at the conference in September. So there's lots to do in UKIP going forward beyond this general election. Rebranding, does that mean rebranding itself away from Nigel Farage as well? Uh, no, Nigel will be front of house in this uh, general election. Uh, he'll be on the airwaves and no, you'll no doubt have him on TV shows like this and he'll be out campaigning with UKIP members. Okay. Okay, Paul Nuttall.